So these are questions that the board has drafted. Um, District 2 covers a large area of a city with many neighborhoods with diverse needs. Our neighborhood, Mecca Park, is an economically diverse, affordable, and family-oriented residential community, which are qualities the city claims to value. Yet city policies that favor dense development and with the new San Antonio Com Comprehensive Plan, it threatens to disrupt our neighborhood. So my first question is about current city policy. What is your plan to focus the city's efforts on protecting our community and its neighborhood district conservation plan? Usually I like to repeat the question. That's was such a long question, so, I'm, so just make sure I understand it correctly. What would I do as a city council person to preserve the plan that's out by Mecca Park? The conservation plan. Okay. Well, what I tend to do is, when I was on zoning, I did this quite well, many of the neighborhoods, reaching out to the community leaders and their association to ensure that your vested interests are protected. Not buy in to, to, to different types of development. We have to ensure that we are part of the process. When anything comes down to the city council in terms of development or amending processes or policies, our community leaders need to be involved, need to have a stake in the say-so. City council works for you, not the other way around. So what that means is that we have to make sure we take a conscious effort to, make, to reach out to our neighborhood leaders, which is right here in this room, to ensure that you have buy-in and into any kind of uh, plan that does not fit into your comprehensive plan. Your comprehensive plan matters. And that's one thing I think we're getting away from. We have to ensure, yes, the city is growing and it's growing at a very rapid rate. But we still have to protect the individuals that are here today. On zoning, I protect many of the issues that were faced in Maggie Park. I did it all throughout the district. I didn't do it alone. I did it with the help from neighborhoods and leaders like yourself. So my role would be to reach out to neighborhood associations, leaders, activists, to ensure that you're in sharp attack. So I think we can talk about, since I'm the person that can actually take action on this right now, and, and I have taken action, um, we've filed a CCR, uh, gotten other council members that have the similar issues uh, from districts one, three, four, and five, these areas close to downtown that are gonna see these changes. Um, and we're doing what Alta Vista and some of these other neighborhoods that don't have historic districts are doing in order in revamping that program. So I'm working alongside with Councilman Trevino in District 1 and of course uh, your, your leadership here in order to uh, craft changes to this neighborhood conservation district and, and all future neighborhood conservation districts in order to beef up the regulations so that we can have more protection of demolitions of homes, which, is, which has been an issue here, uh, protections of, of what's being rebuilt and how it's being rebuilt, the standards uh, for the different neighborhoods and the overlays that apply to these neighborhoods. So there are a number of things that uh, we've already done as a District 2 office because we've ran into a number of issues where the neighborhood uh, thought that their neighborhood conservation district could do more and I think a lot of you remember these issues and it's really uh, not as strong as it should be and that's why we're, we're working to make those changes. So Councilman Trevino, another architect, we're both, uh, he's a practicing architect, I'm trained in architecture. Uh, so we understand historic uh, homes and historic districts and, and the building standards that should be in these neighborhoods. And uh, we're working to make those uh, changes in place right now. So this hopefully can happen before the May election. We're, we're sending it through uh, two, two different committees, and uh, essentially this could be a, a non-issue or less of an issue for your neighborhood as the density keeps growing down the Broadway corridor. Again, we have $43 million, nearly $43 million going to the Broadway corridor and the bond. That type of city investment is gonna spur a great deal of, of private investment, so we wanna make sure that our neighborhood conservation districts are strong uh, before that investment comes. I'm going to be extra careful with this court. One of the partners at work tripled the court Friday and Thursday and fractured her shoulder. So, so I will come out there. You'll understand. But as, um, 
as you're asked about that, one of the things I say is that if you don't value your community, nobody's going to value it for you. And if whatever the priority is in that neighborhood, what makes the neighborhood happy that you live in, is the things that I want to focus on. As councilwoman, it's not, I'm not here to tell you what you need to have, what you should want, but I'm here to serve you to make sure that your needs and wants are um, addressed and that they are um, fulfilled. And the one thing that makes San Antonio such a great place is the diversity within the, within the community and within the people. So whatever it takes to make sure that those conservation needs are met, those, those things will truly be addressed. Um, I'm here to communicate, total communication with you all so that I can just be that voice within City Hall to make sure those things happen and that we're not forgotten about. One of the things I think is that San Antonio is taken for granted in a lot of ways, even to include other areas. But sometimes people look and they say, oh, those people, they're, they're okay, you know. But that's not the case. And we have to make sure we don't have blinders on to what people want and need in their, in their neighborhood. They're raising their families there. They're um, raising their grandkids there. They're having grandkids there with them. But that's just the place they've invested in that they want to live out the rest of their lives. So whatever it takes for you all to be happy in your district or in your neighborhood within the district, we want to make sure that that's taking place. So those things that are um, that we're concerned about, you know, we won't sweep them under the rug, but I'll make sure that those things are addressed within, you know, as as the person that you elected me to be to serve you. Thank you. As the only other person who sat on city council other than Councilman Ward, let me tell you this, he's being a bit disingenuous. The last thing the city wants is for your conservation district to be strong. Strong, informed citizens are not what they like down there. I'll just tell you right now. They don't. They don't want you to be strong. They don't want you to have knowledge. Committees here, committees there. If the committees don't include you every step of the way, why have them? It sounds good, it's punching a ticket. You have to have someone there who's going to be strong and insist that you, the people, it's your conservation history, that you have a say. Not just a say, the major say. He alluded to a CCR. Raise your hand if you know what a CCR is. I can count the people in the room. I already know you did. That's a council consideration request. <clears throat> we can talk about what it does and what it doesn't do, what it's supposed to do, and, and how it works later. But this is what I'm talking about. We don't want to acronym you to death. I'm a former soldier. I work for the government now. We love acronyms. We just dazzle you with acronyms. We don't want you to really be informed and know what they're about. Though. So just know that when I'm there, you will have a say. Because my say will come from you. What comes out of me will come directly from you. Not something from a committee, because I seek higher political office in four or five years. I'm 65. In four or five years, I'm just going to seek that rocking chair. That's it. I'm done. I just want to be the best district two city councilman I can be. So you don't have to worry about that. I'm not trying to dazzle you to seek higher office. I'm trying to inform you so that we can move district two together forward. Thank you. Next question is around the San Antonio Comprehensive Plan. The latest planning map shows Ricky Park has been moved into the Midtown District. And we're slated for planning action in the first year of this multi-year process. From what we have heard, the Midtown area will get more intensive development. So my question is, are you aware of this move, and what is your vision as our city council representative for the Midtown region, or whatever region we happen to have land in when it's all said and done with the San Antonio Comprehensive Plan? Thank you for the question, Joe. Uh, so, how many people know about SA tomorrow or SA 2040? It's a couple more people. 
Okay, so this is our comprehensive planning effort that has focused on the growth of our city. We know that about a million, million and a half people are going to be here by 2040, more than what are here right now, which means about 142 people are coming here every day to the city of San Antonio, and we need to find places for them to live in the city and also in the surrounding suburbs. So we're working with, it's a regional comprehensive plan. It's not just with the city of San Antonio. Now, uh, what uh, Johnny alluded to was the midtown block where there's going to be uh, potential changes. But again, so what happens, we're gonna bring in the neighborhood association leadership. We're gonna bring in all the neighborhoods, whether it's River Road or Tobin Hill, which are kind of gonna be in this area and allow them to one, make updates to their comprehensive neighborhood plans if they want to, and that's the key, if they want to. If not, then the neighborhood plans stay the same and we work around those neighborhood plans in order to make sure that the zoning is correct along the fringes of those neighborhoods. In order to uh, make sure that, one, we have the right types of zoning along our major corridors like Broadway, New Braunfels, Hildebrand, et cetera, but then also that we can uh, also accommodate the neighborhoods and the people that are already here in those neighborhoods. So it's gonna be a, a plan that, it's gonna take 15 months, so there's gonna be very many meetings, and uh, I'm, I was on the uh, planning committee for SA tomorrow with uh, Councilman Nuremberg, and there's a great deal of work that's gonna be going into it afterwards. That comprehensive plan is actually not uh, what you think it is. It's really more of a, a playbook. But we determine, we the people of San Antonio determine how that how those plays are run and what happens. So we still have a lot of say in how fast we get to uh, this uh, these goals and, and what we look like in 2040. So And it's gonna be reviewed every five years as well so that we can uh, make sure that we're going in the right direction. Thank you. Well, I always say it's not what you what you hear, sometimes it's what you don't hear. And what I heard here is that this has already been put in place without your consideration. Now we're trying to be reactive because the people are complaining. What should have gone for it is that you should have been addressed and considered to begin with. Apparently you are in this neighborhood because you like this neighborhood, and now you don't want to be pitched or squeezed by the development that they want to do for it, should make you uncomfortable. People don't realize those things around you also affect you greatly. And one of the things I already said is communication. I'm not here to tell you what you want to do, but San Antonio is a very big city. We have a lot of places that we can expand, other parts of the city, even other parts of the district that can serve that growth without impeding on your particular neighborhood. And that's something that we need to address. And as a person or a city council person, that's what I will be there for to say, hey, these people are happy. There may need to be some positive changes that go forth, but we don't want to upset this neighborhood the way it is. You know, they're, they're happy with this. There may be some changes or infrastructure needs that need to be addressed, but we don't want to squeeze them out because we think that the people coming in, you know, certain things should be made or certain developers um, should be given certain privilege. So, I mean, that is something that we really have to look at. Like I said, I'm a very proactive person. So coming to you first is what should have been done within this goal and not come back trying to be reactive to the situation of the mess that has already gotten started. And I like to say, yes, I, I told you all, all what I do. You know, but one thing about me, if you've heard my job, is that I'm a multitasker. And I'm one of those people who believe that there's a season for everything in the sun. I've been in radio 20 years. I've already told my boss, don't expect me to be there much longer. The firm I'm at, I've already told them that my time has changed. I love doing taxes, but I'm ready to serve the community. listening to Joni that you all weren't consulted before in this plan being proposed to move to the Midtown District. Who was consulted on that? Okay. Okay. You see, that's what I mean about being disingenuous. Words matter. The councilman said, and then we will allow, we will allow you to have input. Isn't that a chance of the city? To allow you 
to have some input on your future, on, on where you are in this comprehensive plan. Believe this, in the minds of your representatives, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Don't be fooled. It's a done deal. Your input, if your input really mattered, it would have, you would have been giving it up front. Up front. Not on the back end. That's what democracy is about. Councilman also said, we determined and then he caught himself and said, we the people. No, he was right the first time. We meant we. We, the folks at City Hall, determine, will determine X, Y, Z. And he caught himself because this is a forum and we're running for election or re election. We, the people, should have said we the people up front, not we the people as an afterthought. You won't be an afterthought with me. There's no way, no matter, no matter how that plays out, and it may not be a bad thing for you, it's the process I'm having an issue with that you should have been advised up front, not on the back end. Thank you. I'm going to somewhat agree with what was said by, uh, by Mr. Brown and Mr. Tony that this is an ongoing process. We need community input. We need community support. We should be making decisions without your advice, without your input, without your knowledge and education of what's going on. It's easy to just fool individuals with a bunch of acronyms or a bunch of words or processes that, that your average citizen doesn't understand. I didn't understand it until I was appointed to zoning. I took zoning very seriously. I sat there, I studied zoning. I learned zoning. So I can articulate what zoning means to individuals. That's what needs to happen in our city. As our city continues to grow, becomes more diverse, and begins to grow up, we need to ensure that our residents and our constituents are being educated and informed of what's going on. That's my goal as city council person. I want to make sure everyone's involved in the end result. Not just a few players, not just a few developers. This is our community. It's not their community, it's about us. I'm looking for constant communication, feedback, and y'all make the, the final decision. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is something that's kind of close at home to us, and it's around uh, IDC zoning. Um, as some of you may know, IDC was created to make it easier to redevelop odd uh, lots in the inner cities uh, by relaxing certain requirements, sometimes excluding site plans, parking, traffic acceptance. However, it seems like IDC is now being used to bring in high density housing and providing basically a blank check for developers. So in our neighborhood, AT&T is, is looking and planning to request a zoning change for his office site to corner uh, Broadway and Hildebrand from C3 to IBC. Mankey Park, along with some other neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, are looking into the possibility of requesting an amendment to the IBC zoning that will exclude its use in historic or our NCD neighborhoods. So my question would be with all this background is what are your thoughts on um, IDZ zoning and in particular IDZ zoning in a neighborhood like ours which is NCD? You know it's like when, when people see something that looks good it's like they want to be a part of it. And it really sounds like, unfortunately, this has been a really nice neighborhood that I've admired um, over the years. And to have a company come in here to bring such a development does you a great disservice. And that is something that really needs to be looked at and readdressed. And to see the long-term effect of those rezoning issues. And that is just something that, as your community, if that's something that you don't want there, I really think it would take a lot away from the community to have such a big corporation to come in here 
and want to do that with the colleges and universities in the neighborhoods. It makes this a nice place to be. And I personally, even though I don't live in your neighborhood, I live in Lakeside, I don't think I'd want that over here for you. And as your council person to hear that, that is something that we have to, to address immediately. Because we know there's a process of things that take time. And that being a high concern to you all, there's something that could be done. There's a lot of other places that AT&T could go. There's a lot of empty land within District 2 where they can go and develop. And that's something we want to do. We need to broaden those out so that, therefore, when the growth comes, we have, a, um, have it spread out equally and not try to confound everything because the long-term effect of doing that are some of the things that people are not even necessarily thinking about when it comes to roads, infrastructure, and then traffic and things going on like that. So I think that is something that needs to be addressed and changed. And we have to really take into consideration how we rezone certain areas. I understand we want to get rid of empty lots, but you don't want to just stick anything up in there. Thank you. I'm not anti-development at all, and I'm not anti-developers at all. Again, it's it's how you do what you do. Um, and developers are known for lots of things, no offense to any developers in the room, but they're not known for being particularly magnanimous. So I don't think they're developers who say, we want to build this building, work for this IDZ zoning, because it will help inner city residents. I just don't know that that's their thought process. Their thought process is, can I make as much money as I can, as quick as I can? This is going to exacerbate the problem of density that y'all are concerned about. It's going to make it worse. There's no other way. Push it now. Push it immediately. Be aggressive and get it done. Try to get it done. Hopefully, you'll have me there to help you. Get it done. Get that amendment done. If not, once those floodgates open, there will be no stopping the developers. None at all. So that would be my advice to you. Push this now. Push it aggressively. If not, you'll rue the day you did. I believe the question is, uh, related to IDZ, how can we change UDC to positively or eliminate the loophole from IDZ. When I was on zoning, IDZ was probably one of the most controversial issues that we faced in the city. As a zoning commissioner, we, we drafted and proposed an amendment for the, to change IDZ because IDZ was originally used for downtown. That was, the, that was the spirit of that amendment, or the conception of IDZ, was to be used to fill vacant lots and empty buildings in the downtown area. What tends to happen is attorneys for developers found the loophole. So now IDZ can be used anywhere in the city. That was not the intent. The intent was to fill downtown and make downtown a more, a more vibrant community for downtown. IDZ that has no business being out in our communities. So as a city council person, I would bring that back to the forefront. We need to readdress IDZ from a city council perspective. We tried it through zoning, they got shot down from the committee. So what happens is the committee is over, oversees our proposals. They ever say yes or no. They shot down our UDC amendment for IDZ. Once again, we have to bring it back up. And like Mr. Tony said, we need to make sure it happens. I've read the, the IDZ amendments. I understand how the IDZ amendments work. They're not meant for communities. They're not meant for neighborhoods. They're solely meant for vacant lots and empty buildings downtown. So this uh, question brings us back to that council consideration request, that CCR, and that's the reason I filed it. We, once I heard this concern from uh, Ms. Brooks and some of the other neighbors uh, about Bastoni and some of the properties that he's done um, in your neighborhood and then some of the other encroachments that are, that are trying to get in, we filed the CCR because we saw that Councilman Trevino was also working on his neighborhoods in District 1, and we know that you all formed an alliance during the SA Tomorrow planning process. So uh, that downtown neighborhood alliance is working with Council 1 and Council 2 in order to make sure that our neighborhoods aren't left behind 
with this IDZ zoning. So again, the process is already underway. We're, we're working with you all to create this, and we filed the CCR almost a month ago. So it's, it's definitely something that, once we heard the concerns, uh, we thought it was definitely something that we should address and address quickly, like uh, former Councilman Tony said. And it can't wait till after the election. It can't wait till uh, we start really moving forward on this essay tomorrow process because there's going to be a lot of IDZ zoning applications that come through. And again, we haven't, since I've been in office, we haven't approved any IDZ zoning in Mankey Park. And uh, so this is since December of 2014. So we haven't approved any IDZ zoning in Mickey Park. So any IDZ zoning that's happened in your neighborhood happened uh, before I got here and possibly under the watch of uh, Mr. Shaw, who was the zoning commissioner for Mayor Taylor. So you need to think about it in that, in that regards, where a lot of these pressures, uh, this person was sitting at the table when a lot of these things occurred. So um, it's, it's definitely something to consider and, and hopefully uh, you help me with this process moving forward as we work with other district uh, one and district two neighborhoods in order to help the downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Really, the last question that, uh, that we that the board has before we turn it over to the audience is so your on, on process as this essay tomorrow cons comprehensive plan uh, moves forward that uh, guidelines are respected and incorporated by the city of San Antonio. For example, it's a common occurrence that our neighborhood goes before the commissions and boards who know nothing about NCDs, historic districts, and case by case our NCDs and guidelines are eroded. So our question to you is how can we ensure that as we move forward that the San Antonio, city of San Antonio uh, uh, boards and uh, employees are, and all our guidelines are incorporated into uh, the process so that they're informed. First of all, I'm glad to hear Mr. Shaw criticize the terms. That was, that was interesting for me. And, and, uh, and Councilman Warren was right. Mr. Shaw was the chairperson of the Zoning Commission. So some of this lands in his lap. It has to. Some of these, these issues land directly in his lap. It was on his watch. Now, the city of San Antonio employees must be brought up to speed. That's not easy to do. It's like turning an ocean line to get some of that done. But you have to start the process. Mr. Work is big on process. This is in process. You know, the checks in the mail. We need to start getting some checks in our hands. Yes, you want them involved. You're right, they should be, so that they have some knowledge. Some knowledge. You're never going to make people on boards and commissions have all the knowledge you want because they're political appointees for the most part. So they're there because uh, it's big bank. That's reality. That's how it works. Generally, it's payback. So you get people, we see it on the national level, you get someone who's uh, in charge of the Department of Education who has no education. It's the same thing on the local level. You have someone who doesn't, who's never had any experience in something and all of a sudden, they're in charge of it. So that's not going to be an easy task. I, I agree with you, it should be done. It's not going to be an easy task. But it has to start. We have to start so that people know why they're there. No, why are they serving? It's not just to be there and enjoy the fruits and vegetables and all that fresh stuff that's back behind the scenes that you all don't see but you pay for. That's not why I said That's not what we do. So yes, folks need to know what they're there for and do what they're supposed to do. And again, it's not rocket science, it's representative government. We're there to represent you. How ironic we're talking about education as being you know, two city council people here in front of us this, this evening about educating the zoning process. Then they would realize that the zoning process is only a recommending body. Council makes the final decision. Talk about education. The decisions we make has to go through council. We're only a recommending body. 
With that being said, when I was on zoning, I would go to community meetings and educate individuals about the zoning process. We should not have zoning commissioners that are appointed to these positions because of payback. We should appoint people to our boards and commissions who want to serve our communities, who's eager to learn, who's eager to want to be there. Our goal is to make sure we come to you and say, who wants this position? Let's do this. Give you the material that you need to learn. And it's a lot of work. But when you care about something, when you love something so much, you put in the effort, you put in the time. Like many of us did. We put our time in. So in terms of education, we have to be more proactive, reaching out to our constituents in our district, informing them on city processes and city governance. Thank you. So again, there are a number of neighborhood conservation districts throughout the city of San Antonio that are up on the chopping block. But why do we have this city council consideration request for these specific neighborhoods? So with uh, Alta Vista on Councilman Trevino and with Mankey Park, so that anything that comes up in the meantime while we're working on changing this law and changing this ordinance is put on hold. If we don't list your neighborhood, then things will just fly right past all the city staff because I think that's what the original question was. Uh, if, if we don't have a CCR that lists Mankey Park specifically, even though Councilman Trevino is talking about Alta Vista that's a similar neighborhood, it doesn't matter. It just flies right past city staff. But now, because our CCR is in place, we have protections on Mankey Park, so anything's going to get double and triple checked before it goes through these processes as far as any uh, infractions to the NCD or changes to the NCD or zoning that may not follow the NCD. So again, they're not going to let anything move forward as long as this council consideration request is, is in place. So I, I, I just want to make that clear, and uh, hopefully they don't muddy it up again. But it's just sort of That are, that are part of the city of San Antonio, and the people that are on it seem to be the same few people. The same few people can't represent all of District 2. We need to have a way that we reach out to the different communities, whether it's going through the neighborhood and homeowners associations, and say, hey, this is what's out there, and we need your input. You need to be included to make sure that these that we're aware of it. You know, um, I live in Lakeside. I don't live over here. So I don't really know what's going on in your particular neighborhood until I ask you. Like I said, if you don't value your neighborhood, nobody else will. And to be a part of San Antonio and to keep it great the way it is, is that we all need to be included. We all need to see through the other person's eyes and try to walk a mile in their shoes. And in this position as councilwoman, I will make sure that we go forth to ensure that you have a voice in what goes on in the city, in this district that affects you. Because that's ultimately what it's about, is you, the people. That's why we're here in San Antonio. That's why we're a part of this. That's why y'all are here today. It's because you want us to know that you, that you matter. You know, you want us to know that, hey, you have concerns, you know, and that when we leave here tonight, you still have those concerns, and you expect us to step up and speak out on your concerns and to truly represent you. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that we communicate with you to ensure that these things don't happen and continue to happen as they are. Okay, thank you very much. So the floor is open if anyone has a question, come up here and use the microphone. Hi, 
So the, what we have to do is find out what's going on in, within your community and then have a, a range that we can gauge it by. You know, and just stuff with a whole bunch of development here with um, apartments just to say that somebody lives there, just to say you have affordable housing, may not be the best that's in that neighborhood. There's some neighbors you want to keep that, you want to conserve as a conservation issue, you want to keep that historical value within the city because that may be the thing that attracts people to move here. So when it comes to affordable housing, we really have to just not, in our own minds, decide what's affordable, but to look at what the, a neighborhood has to offer, what it has to offer to the city, and how that can be basically, you'd say like this, marketed to grow the city. You know, when we look at people coming here, when we look at development coming here, we want to say what that has to offer. Even like in being working radio, people ask us, well, how many people are listening? How far do you reach? You know, those are your, your selling points. Those are the things that people look for. So when it comes to this neighborhood, when it comes to affordable housing, we have to look at where you're already at and then come up with a true plan that, that you all approve that's going to affect you. We don't want to throw somebody, something in there and then it brings down the whole value of the neighborhood just because we want to make it affordable. So really is that something that needs some work, something that we need to focus on and not just throw out there just to say we made something happen. And that's where we come in with communication between the residents and the council person and bring that forth to City Hall. First of all, there has to be a clear delineation between property rights and developers' rights. Property rights, we understand. Developers' rights becomes a little bit of fuzzy math for me. If you don't want a 12-unit apartment complex in your area, in your neighborhood, it shouldn't happen. It just shouldn't happen. Now, checks and balances. There were supposedly checks and balances in place with the IDC. You heard it's gotten out of control. That's what will happen here. No, Councilman Ward was right. There may not be a lot of fallow land in Maggie Park, but developers will find land. Because you wake up in the morning and what used to have a structure on it doesn't anymore. Now we have land. On the other side, same thing. Guess what? Now that developer has land. So don't be fooled that, well, there's no land. This isn't really an issue. It is an issue. It's an issue you better stay on top of because it, because it can happen. Even single family residents should not be anything that doesn't fit into your neighborhood architecturally. It really shouldn't. And so you need to just be very, very diligent about that because it can happen. Should it, but it can. So we need to focus on property rights. That's fine. That's constitutionally fine. Isn't that right, Council? Okay. <laughs> rights are always good. However, watch out. The developers will come in and exercise their rights too. First, for you, Councilman, and then anybody else wants to chime in. So, back to the neighborhood contribution plan. So, um, just first of all, the point of information or clarity. The proposed ordinance changes that you said are in the works right now, maybe voted on as early as May, is that regarding strengthening NCPs in general, or specifically strengthening our NCP and what's our room you were mentioned, you were talking about? That's part one. Question and just a continuation on that is whether whichever one of those two it is, can you be specific? What kinds of changes have been proposed to strengthen NCDs? Because it, if you have a limited time frame, it would be pretty general in terms of strengthening the NCD. Specifically, how and what ways? And then, if anybody has something that you don't think that you would do differently than what his answer is, I'd love to hear what you would do differently. Thank you for the question. Again, I think 
the former council of the county uh, got a little confusing. It was for adding affordable housing, not, not keeping affordable housing out of your neighborhood. So again, uh, she wants to add affordable housing. It's not, and, and it's hard to get developers to do that, so we have to incentivize that program. And we, we do that in other places. Um, to your question, so with NCD, there are a couple things that were mentioned. That IDZ case um, at uh, Hildebrand and Broadway with at and uh, as far as uh, IDZ either ordering or in historic districts is, is one thing that we're looking at. Two, uh, front-facing garages was another one of the issues that on the rebuild of homes after their, after their demolition. And then there's uh, more checks and balances as far as the lot lengths, um, how many houses can go on a property, and, and we want to make a clear playbook, because right now it's, it's clear that developers are, are taking advantage of the neighborhoods, and they're able to come in and build you know, five homes where there was one home, six homes where there was where, where two homes, and, and that makes people uncomfortable, that's definitely a lot of change, and the NCD doesn't have any way to slow that down or lessen that number or, or make the developers comply as long as they follow the current rules. So that's what we're looking at in that case. So, so you're proposing changes that will, that will do what? That, that, that will give NCPs more oversight? Teeth? Yeah, well, they have. When it comes to, they have to limiting density or, or what? Yeah, based on their neighborhood conservation plan and their, uh, their comprehensive plan for the neighborhood. So those are two different things. The NCP. All of these are going to happen for citywide, but with the focused neighborhoods, if anything's coming through the works or coming through city processes, we know it takes a while. We know to double check these things, and that's why we added Mankey Park to the list of neighborhoods that are working on, on, on these programs, mostly inner city NCPs. Um, but uh, did I, did, you see what I'm saying? So any change that happens, let me just restate any change that happens will happen citywide. The reason why Mankey Park and those other neighborhoods are listed. Is because if if this may be a stretch in terms of protecting NCPs. I would like to see communities that are with NCPs have a say so in the process. So if anything gets that wants to go through in a certain NCP community. For example, maybe part will have a committee or a subsection that wants to review the plans that affect your communities. And that will go throughout the city. So because every community is different, we can't just put a blanket ordinance on everybody. So you, for all those, all those communities that are labeled or designated as NCP, before any development occurs in that community, you have individuals from that community oversee the documents, oversee the plans, oversee any uh, Rezoning they would like to apply for, and then y'all get the ultimate say so. Or you have, I'm not sure if council will, I was the ultimate say so. But y'all should be able to oversee projects in your communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and I'm assuming based on what you said about the zoning commission, the zoning commission can only make recommendations. I'm assuming that neighborhood associations are more powerful than that. And all we could do would be to review and make a recommendation, not have a final say so. And you're right. You're right. But what's interesting is that council listens to constituents when it's the zoning because y'all vote. Just to be on the focus, it is N C D like district. Not P like a Yeah, so just to be on the N C D is our what we're talking about right now. Right, correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. And, uh, hey, hey. My name is Emily Sapisa, and I live in Westport. And I know in Westport and Dayton Whitty Hill, property taxes are rising really rapidly in valuations. And I think this is going to be an issue with affordable housing. And forcing people out. I mean, I look at it, things uh, keep on the same track as they are. I see a day where I won't either won't be able to retire ever, or I will have to sell my house. Because I won't be able to afford the property taxes. Uh, you know, the freeze at age 65 is not particularly helpful because the lion's share of the taxes, school district taxes. Do y'all have any ideas for addressing this problem? Yes, 
got to just make a simple statement on this. And that's one of the things when I said about affordable housing. Um, that's difficult because we need to look at what we consider affordable. And you don't want to just throw some things up to say we developed something and brought something into the neighborhood where it drives up the taxes for those individuals that are already there. We do have to look at making a positive change in the neighborhood and bringing about um, residents in there, you know, in those areas to bring up the value of it. But we don't want to over exceed or over extend for the people that are already there. So that's something we have to really um, be mindful of. And as we talk to the constituents in there, we have a communication before we try to implement all these ordinances and changes. That's something we need to do going forward, to be more proactive. You don't want to be reactive, and then you haven't done any good at all. So in just saying that, that's something I want to bring, make sure I bring to the office and make sure we have the communication and, and ask you what you're looking for in your neighborhood. You know, what you desire in this neighborhood. What can we do to make your quality of life in your neighborhood better? And so therefore, you know, going forth, we won't have a situation where people will feel like they're just being run over and taken for granted as well. You are 60 years old and you've been an owner occupier of your property for 25 years. That's 85. I mean, you've paid your taxes, you've paid your dues. Ms. Peace, I agree with you 100%. My youngest child is a 36 year old Army major. I'm having children in school. And you're right, at some point, you may be priced out of your house. Not that you can't pay for your house, you may have already paid for it. I just think that's un-American, that because of taxes, it's un-American, but it's not by default, it's by design, I think, to allow folks to come in and then grab it. This is not hypothetical, we've seen it. You see it right now. Big Moody Hill's a great example. And it's, it's coming to you next, Mr. Lewis, if it hasn't happened already. So that folks can price you out of your house through taxes. And our older population has now unscrupulous developers knocking on their doors because they know they may be behind in taxes to take their homes. I won't be a part of that as a city council person. I'll stop it. I'll stop it. I won't. I'm not, I'm not trying to profit from it. I'm not buying any lots. I'm not doing any of that. Mr. Works camp said that Mr. Shaw was doing that. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> it came from Mr. Works camp. It was in the Express News. It was in the Express News newspaper. That was part of the political staff. That he was doing that. I have no proof of that at all. I have absolutely no proof of that. And, and uh, he may he, he may have uh, he may have uh, but uh, Trump Tower's revolution. Okay. 
My plan, honestly, we have to sit down and figure this thing out. It's not a plan where you can do one plus one equals two. Okay, it, it doesn't work that way. This will take people who are involved, educated in the tax code, people in the community, our seniors, excuse me, this legislature. If, if, if this is an issue that affects communities nationwide, if I didn't know the answer to this question, I should be up there in D.C. with our current president. Okay? But I will sit down and develop and try to figure out a way to figure this thing out because our amenities have to be paid for. Now, who's going to pay for it? So the city has come up with some answers. And again, this doesn't exactly apply to Mickey Park right now. But if you were to apply, because most of these areas are historic areas where all this uh, flux is happening and you, you see property values jump, you know, 100% in, in one year or two years for a lot of these homes. So what the city has done, they've set in place a 20% reduction in property taxes for newly, uh, newly formed historic districts. So what, what does that mean? If you were to change this NCD into a historic district, you automatically, every, every home in the district would see a 20% decrease in property taxes from the city, from the city. Now, again, that's only 22 cents on the dollar. Again, the, the county, the school district, the, uh, the metropolitan, uh, uh, or the uh, county hospital, all these things take up that other 78 cents. But on that 22 cents, you'd see a 20% reduction for five years. And then any improvements that you put into your homes, you'd also see reductions um, in that if you make an improvement, you can have your rate frozen at the pre-approved value uh, in a historic district, not in an NCD, but in a historic district. So we can apply that to NCDs as well because you guys are seeing that. And that's one of the things that we're also looking at. I, I know I, I'm adding things on, but we don't have a lot of time to answer these questions. But again, the conversation is up. You guys are a part of the conversation because you're the reason why we filed the CCR. It, it doesn't say any other neighborhoods on it. It's solely for making parts. So uh, when we get uh, conversations talking about a lack of responsiveness or communications, I take offense to that because, again, you could say that, but, but if you can let me know when they call, what number they call from, I can actually tell you if it happened or not. This is the city of San Antonio. We, we're able to track those records. So if there is someone that actually called my office and didn't get a call back, give me the number. Give me the time and the day that it happened, and, and let's see if it actually happened. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Maybe other people can. But why, why is that so negative? 
you're, you're about to retire, you should be excited. I am excited. I am excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, I've asked a question. Uh, yeah, is that the question why you're excited about it? There's a question there somewhere, so I'm going to try to address this. I think it's one of the biggest issues, is that there's a huge disconnect between the entire district. Just because you live in Maggie Park doesn't mean you should have a conversation or understand what's going on in government here, digging with you. All throughout the district, Maggie Park does not sit alone. District 2 is made up of a lot of diverse communities. There's no reason why Maggie Park to be isolated. There's no reason why Maggie Park should be uh, a stepchild along with the other Northeast communities in our district. We're all one community, we're all one district. We need to have leadership and representation that brings us all back together. We need to know what each other's desires and wants are. What's happening in Maple Park? And they, oh, no, I want to know what's happening in Dignity Lady Hill. I want to know what's happening in Denver Heights. And how can we help each other out? Because at the end of the day, we're still one community. Regardless of income, regardless of race, regardless of occupation, we're all one community. We work together. And we can grow together and protect each other together. So I think that's one of the biggest issues that I'm sensing from that question is that we're so disconnected. There's nothing wrong with living in Mankey Park. I like living in Mankey Park. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. I'm happy to be here with a, a packed house, a room full of, of, of neighbors, and that's pretty much how I've seen you. You're my neighbors in, in Mankey Park, and that's why I uh, enjoy, definitely enjoy the time that I've, I've served you and all, and all the neighborhood associations. And we do our part, um, whether it's Millie or anyone else on my team, to empower you as much as we can, whether we're, we're bringing city staff to meet with you, whether we're we're sitting in your, your living rooms and, and you know having a coffee in the evening, or or whether we're you know on a, on a construction site. Either way, this neighborhood is a great neighborhood. People see the benefits of it. That's why they're moving in here, and, and they see the great things. We need to maintain and keep those great things happening. And and uh, Jose, I understand there's there's a lot of emotions there. Um, I'm glad that I was able to get your business open as quickly as I could with. With collaboration to the neighborhood, I know things are tough, but I think you guys have been a responsible um, addition, and I'm, I'm glad that you are doing well. I'm glad business is, is going well, and and I look forward to seeing you guys. That's, that's, you got a little time for a plug? Yes, I do. Uh, so I'll be at uh, Commonwealth Coffee, Jose's business, um, on uh, the 31st, which is next Friday. So from 4 to 6.30, you guys can uh, come out, meet the council member, uh, get a free coffee, and uh, just uh, let's have a conversation. Talk about the community, talk about making Park going forward, and I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Well, I want to say I'm, I'm happy to be here as well. Um, I will say I am not a politician at all. I am a concerned citizen who's lived in this district. And since 95. Uh, from my personal experience, um, I left home at the age of 19. I put myself through college and I was always always pushed to do to do my best. Um, I built my home at the age of 27 and there's a lot of things I didn't know. A lot of things about neighborhoods I didn't know. All I know is I was working and paying for that house and trying to enjoy life and put myself through college. I went through a Lake Lake Weekend College and then I saw this duplex hand built in my neighborhood. I'm like, how did this get here? You know, but at that age, I didn't know how to fight, you know, for my neighborhood. And now I'm at this point, and I'm so happy to see you all here for people speaking out. Like I said, you don't just appreciate the value of your neighborhood. Nobody else will. And so one of the things I'm here today is to make sure that I can speak out and speak up on behalf of you. The young man who started your business, congratulations. I tell people to be your own boss is the hardest job you have ever loved because you're not your own boss. Your customer and your clients are really your boss. And I'd like to know where it is so I can support you. You know, I became a mother for the first time at the age of 41. So why I stand here today is to make sure I'm making a difference for that young man over there. I understand, I appreciate all that's going forth and all that's taking place within what we're trying to do here to represent District 2. 
and I just want to make sure I can be a part of it. I know I look like a young lady, mama raised me that way, but when necessary, I'm truly a fighter, I'm a survivor, I'm that multitasker, I'm that person that, you know, if it blessed me, I want you all blessed as well. And that's why I come here for to um, represent District 2. And it's not about any certain age group. And I don't want to hear another constituent, as I told them, you know, you know, consider voting for me. They were so happy that I was running. They said, because the current councilman, and they use some words, we should never have that happen again. Thank you. excited about being retired, <laughs> but I only do my happy dance at home. Jose, I see that your wounds have healed. What he doesn't tell you is this. The decision I made that was against his business at the time was because of the information I had from the community. It wasn't a decision I made alone. Did we had meetings. Did we not have some meetings about that? Did you not come to city council? and sit down in our conference room with me? So you were in office two days? Yeah, no, 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 you came. The question was, did you come? You did. I called you. You know why I called you and said come back? Because I got information afterwards that made me know I need to reconsider my decision. That's why we have a public court, you know that. We had to reconsider. I got more information when he brought me in the information he should have brought me in the first place. Signatures from the community, folks within 200 feet of the business, when he brought that in, I did a CCR immediately. I said, this has changed. We have to save this business. And we did. And we did. And he's open today. So, Councilman for the record, you didn't open it back up. I opened it back up. Because my decision actually closed him. So I had to make it right. So there's nothing wrong with making a mistake if you're big enough to come back and make it right, and we did it. The two of you should apologize to this neighborhood for the rating of that board. You co-operated this whole neighborhood that last four months with Darren Hurd. As president of a neighborhood association, that is wrong. Do you have a question? Uh, that's it for the questions. And why don't we take each one of you have like about a minute closing statement, and then we'll call for tonight. Once again, uh, thank you for allowing us to speak before you into this this evening. It's very interesting. Um, uh, once again, I'm doing it for us. It's not about me. I have no personal gratification stepping up, putting myself out there to be in politics. I have never ran for anything before in my life. I never ran for city council. You never saw my name on a ballot for a judge or city council before. You never see me run for a, uh, whatever it's out there. I'm here because I want to serve. That's why I put my practice in the district. That's why I bought property in the district. I have three lots, one for my house, one for my office, the other one I don't know what I'm gonna do with yet. You gotta be careful. <laughs> but I, I, I can actually be invested without putting my money where my mouth is. I care about this community. I wanna live in this community. I wanna work in this community. I'm here for the community, nothing else. I'm here to be your voice. When you feel that you're unheard. I'm here to go on that dais and speak for you and nobody else for District 2. So again, my name is William Shaw. I'm asking for your vote, District Two City Council. Thank you. Again, thank you, Mackey Park, for for having this forum and allowing us to get some of these words out. Thank you, Nowcast, for uh, filming this and, and letting more people around the city and the district uh, see uh, what's going on in District Two, but also what's going on in, in, in numerous events throughout our city. Nowcast is a great resource, and uh, they're President is one of uh, District 2 residents as well, Mickey Park is there. But uh, Mr. Shaw has been in the district for a year. Um, he, he, ha he has been in Mickey Park for less than three months, or four months. And I haven't seen him at any Mickey Park meetings. There's a number of things that it takes to manage an area that's larger than Washington, D.C., that's larger than San Francisco, that has over 140,000 people. 
and I've been doing those things, no, it hasn't been perfect. I know that um, things happen and I've made mistakes, but I've made uh, promises to the neighborhoods to support them, and I've done just about everything I can do to support Mickey Park and all the other neighborhoods. I do thank you for your support, and I look forward to serving you for another two years, if you allow. Thank you. Jose so pointed out, uh, he said at the other other meeting, we talked a lot about jobs, and today here we talked about zoning. And that is one thing that we have to be mindful of. Everything does it affects people in different ways. And we have to be able to communicate with the residents in District 2. Because everybody's priority is different. Everybody's requirements for the quality of life is different. And that's something I have to be mindful of. So as um, I hopefully that you would vote for me, Dory Brown, that I will make sure that's a priority. You know, as we go through the debates, people are asking, like, what's our number one priority? It's really hard to put a number one in it because there's so many things that affect everybody differently. But the main thing we have to be mindful of is to be mindful of the people. And that's one thing I will always do, is come to you and talk to you. Have you come to me have that open door policy. You know, as a licensed minister, I hear so many things of people being counseling. And sometimes I don't always understand it because I haven't had to go through that sort of situation. But knowing that and what is pressing to them has to be pressing to me at that time. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I didn't see it. I got you. Thank you. some of the things about what really goes on in City Hall that is supposed to represent you. It's not negative. It's just factual. And it may be really, really tough to hear some of these things, but I think you need to hear it so that you have no illusions about what's going on, what should be going on at City Hall. You can't, the councilman is right, we have a very large, diverse district the size of Washington, D.C. You can't do it as an afterthought. You can't be a city council person as an afterthought. It's not a hobby. It's not a hobby. If someone were to ask you, what do you do for a living? You can't say, I do X, Y, Z, and then on the side, I'm a city council person in one of the largest council districts in your town. It doesn't work. You need a full-time council person. Someone devoted just to you with a true open-door policy. With a phone that will back if you don't get me immediately. Actually call you back. So thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you now cast for filming this. Everybody have a nice evening. Thank you.